Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Hello, and welcome back to the Potential Psychology Podcast. This is episode 34, and I am your host, Ellen Jackson. If we've not met before, it's lovely to meet you. It's great to have you here. Just so you know a little bit about who you're listening to, I am a workplace and coaching psychologist. I live in Ballarat, which is a small town of about 100,000 people in the southeast corner here in Australia. And when I'm not here talking to you, I work with organisations to enhance wellbeing and performance at work. And I'm pretty passionate, I'm very passionate about making work a really positive experience for everyone because we spend so much of our time at work. And when I'm not doing that, I am with my two sons who have just returned to school for the new school year here in Australia and my husband and my cat and my four backyard chickens. And while we're talking about kids returning to school, or I was talking at least about kids returning to school, I don't know about you, but I am very pleased to be getting back into some kind of routine after the long summer break. The school holidays, the summer school holidays, for me, remind me of that quote, my heart swings back and forth between the need for routine and the urge to run. And I I don't know the origin of that quote, but I have loved it ever since I first came across it because it really depicts for me so well how I feel at this time of year. And I'm not ordinarily one for a whole lot of stability and routine. As a consultant, my days and weeks are never the same. And I love that. I love the variety. But after six weeks of really no routine over the summer school holidays, I really feel such a strong need to have some kind of order and predictability back in my days. I think largely because it gives me a sense of control, a feeling of control. And that's something that we know is so important to all human mental health and wellbeing. We all start to feel a little ragged around the edges if we don't feel like we have control over our days and how we manage them. And routines themselves are actually really important to us as well because they save us a lot of time and energy and stress that can come when we have to create each day from scratch, which is what school holidays can feel like. You have to think about what you're going to do each day and how you're going to keep kids occupied or entertained or when you're going to fit tasks in around the chaos and Even mealtimes and bedtime for us has been, you know, they're completely out of whack. There's just been no routine around anything. So it's lovely to be getting back into that kind of routine because it just lessens the decision making, it lessens the thinking, and therefore it lessens our kind of emotional and psychological stress, things that really wear us out. So being back into routine means I've got fewer decisions to make, which is kind of nice, Um, sliding back into getting things done, which is a really refreshing change. So now that I've natted on about routine and what works and what doesn't work for me, and maybe for you, it's time to talk to today's guest about some of the other stories that we tell ourselves. My guest today has found a way to take the human experiences that we're often not great at talking about and make them more accessible through story and storytelling. Her name is Anna Box. She's a psychologist and story strategist. And on any given day, she might be working with screenwriters and actors on unpacking a character's psychology or working with an elite sporting organisation on narrative, or working with a school to bring together positive psychology with spirituality and faith-based 
faith-based messaging, or maybe teaching leaders about the hero's journey. Her work sits firmly at the intersection of story and thriving, and she's here not only to tell us all about it, but also to share her passion for it. Welcome, Anna. (laughs) Thank you very much. It sounds quite spread out, doesn't it, when you say it like that? (laughs) It's an intriguing field and I I am coming at this interview purely from a place of curiosity because your work is not an area I I think I'd even come across having been a psychologist myself for 20 years or something similar. Mm. So Mm. I'm I'm really intrigued. Can you tell us to start with what a story strategist does? Yeah, sure. So a story strategist basically helps people or clients, I guess, unpack their own story or understand story better, I guess. So, yeah, my background's quite varied in that, uh, you know, I cut my teeth in in sort of very community-based psychology, working with, you know, the Department of Human Services and in disability services. So I worked across, you know, that sort of field and then I moved over into, I guess, research and research projects where I was applying a lot of qualitative methodologies and some quant, and I loved the qualitative stuff. I loved the capturing of stories and and, um, sort of identifying themes and putting that through a a sort of strategic lens of analysis, I guess, and and, um, understanding that it's not necessarily what is being said, but how it's being said and what's being left out and where the energy picks up and Mm -hmm. all those sorts of indicators let you know where the inside is and let you know what really matters. So, you know, I've always loved story and storytelling, but I just, I suppose because I had a lens of storytelling, I noticed where I was applying it in work. So I then moved into consumer and communication psychology for probably about 10 to 12, 15 years, and that's where that sort of story strategy work really lifted and elevated, which is really about helping clients or anyone that that has a message to say um, to an audience. And sometimes in, in psychology, the audience is ourselves, as you would understand. Yeah. That's our own messaging to ourselves to just really help people unpack the nature of story in that space and to understand how story works and functions and and um, to understand that just because a story's real doesn't make it true and just because a story is fiction doesn't mean it's not carrying truth. So it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting space, but I guess a story strategist in effect works with the stories that are being told and shared and, and absorbed in our community and in our world. Okay, wonderful. So before I mm. ask you a bit about what that looks like now, <laughs> mm. I'm going to go. I'm going to take tease out a few things that you've said there about your background and and mm. where this kind of came from. Because to start with, I mean, I I'm very similar. I, I the bits of research I've done, I've always loved qualitative over quantitative. Mm. But mm. can you just describe for our audience? Because a lot of our audience don't necessarily have a research background. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what what is the difference and, and what kind of things are you doing when you're doing that qualitative research to un, uncover those stories? Yeah, sure. So well, data that we capture as, as researchers, I guess, can be qualitative or quantitative in nature. So quantitative data is what most people are really familiar with in terms of data that can easily have numbers slotted alongside it. Um, so the types of questions that you might be asked in a survey, like, you know, on a rating of one to five or those sorts of things. And quantitative data tends to ask a different set of questions to qualitative data. So a lot of people assume that one's better than the other. It's not the case at all. They just they they ask and answer different different questions. So if your questions are along the lines of how many and how often, you need quant data. Whereas if your questions are really more why or why not, um, you're wanting to unpack a little bit more about the experience that sits beneath a behaviour or shapes or drives a behaviour then you need qualitative questions. So that's all the open-ended questions where people are literally responding with their own, you know, their own voice and their own language. Yeah. Yeah, so I practice using both, but I've always loved qual data. I think there's a great quote, and I can't remember whose it was, along the lines of what counts can't necessarily always be counted and what is counted doesn't necessarily count. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really nice sort of understanding, I guess, that 
it's sort of not enough to get that sort of really behavioural how often, when did you do that, at what time, you know, that sort of data. We really need to, to tap in and understand the why underneath all our choices and yep. once you get in there, you're in the qualitative storytelling. Okay, and I think that I think mm. similarly that's what I've loved when the bits of research that I have done has been, you know, it's good to have the kind of the hard data, the facts there, but it's the stories mm. and the meaning behind, you mm. know, people's explanation for why they gave that answer or what it was that mm. made them make that choice or, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. And I think, yeah, I worked in, as I said, in sort of disability services and so you're at the coalface and you're dealing with a lot of families and you're hearing their stories and, then I, I just was so lucky to go through my early qualitative training with two brilliant qualitative practitioners. Uh, one was actually a, a, a planner from the UK who worked in advertising, Neil Pascoe, and another was a psychologist who's at the forefront of all this work and sits in very high-level, high-end strategic qualitative analysis. Her name's Vicky Arbez, and they, they were my mentors very early and all I was allowed to do for six months was listen to their sessions and note take Mm -hmm. so you know and I laugh now because you know when I'm then training people in qualitative you know they want to come in and start running group discussions or start running depth interviews straight away they want to listen to something once and then jump in Mm -hmm. all I was allowed to do was listen for six months and then to understand that the difference between what is said in an interview or, or a group discussion environment and what that means for the client, which is only uncovered through strategic analysis of the qualitative data, are poles apart. So now when I'm working with clients, if I'm ever speaking to their audience, for example, on their behalf to unpack the why or to understand some meaning behind messaging or why you would or wouldn't say certain things and what stories to tell and which stories to dial up and which stories to dial down. I'll say to my clients, if I come back to you and my report consists of a whole bunch of what you would have heard if you'd come and sat with me, you can ask for your money back because my job doesn't start, I guess, until the interviews and the group discussions have finished. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. when the real, you know, the analysis and you know, embracing the hermeneutics of it all and writing up the themes. That's that's sort of where it all starts and that's where our, you know, my my office starts looking a little bit like a, you know, uh, those those episodes in Homeland where, <laughs> where she's just got post-it notes and lines going here, there and everywhere and it all starts to look very um, visual and, you know, you're connecting themes and you're, yeah. you know, that's the juicy stuff. And that, yep. that work doesn't start, as you know, until the interviews are done. Mm, mm, and you can start to look for those themes, mm. patterns. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, many of our listeners would know Brene Brown and a lot of her work mm. has been done in, in this. This is where this comes from, all of the wonderful stuff and the stories that she pulls together in her books mm. and TED Talks. And that all comes from qualitative research, doesn't it? Yeah, and I had a laugh. I laughed so much when that first TED Talk hit and they said, well, we'll call you a researcher storyteller. And she was like, well, why not a pixie in the garden or something (laughs) like that? It doesn't feel or sound necessarily robust Mm -hmm. um, enough to Mm -hmm. be science, but it it absolutely is. And Mm -hmm. what I have learned, I guess, about being a qualitative researcher for a very long time is that you, you can do it badly. You can do it poorly. And if I look back when I was, you know, very green and starting out myself, I didn't know what I was doing. So it, it, there is a real skill to it and you mm-hmm. do need to know what to listen out for and what not to listen out for and you do need to know what, you know, agreement in the group means and, you know, where to dig. It's a little bit about sort of just understanding of the client's issues so much having such insight around what your client needs to do that you then go in with the psychology skill set and you can dig where you know they would want to dig and you can move on quickly where you know they would move on. Mm. So it's constantly about tapping and uncovering fresh insight and, yeah, drawing upon themes and, you know, digging around a bit. So, yeah, I love it. It's an art and a science. It is. It really is both, yeah, which is what I do. (laughs) sort of really sit at that nice intersection of applying the, you know, the evidence-based science with with story and, and narrative. Okay. And yeah. can you tell us a little bit about 
the sorts of stories you're dealing with. I know this is going to vary wildly depending mm. on who you're working with at the time, but mm. you know, just some examples to give to give yeah. our listeners a bit of a flavour of this sort of stuff you're doing. Yeah, sure. So, and that's a great question because uh, uh, part of what I do is that I'm working with fresh stories, and by that I mean the first time it's said and told is when I'm capturing it. So I'm in a sense wearing a researcher's hat. And I might be going out on behalf of a, a football club, for example, and speaking to representatives across the business, people from the football department or people from the playing list or um, people from that are members, as an example, about the sorts of stories that exist and live around this business and what resonates and what lights people up and what makes them excited and wanting to get more involved and what sort of distances people, where the relevance and the warmth and the perceptions of confidence kind of lift and rise. So sometimes it's their stories that I'm dealing with, Mm -hmm. and then in other times I'm dealing with stories that are well and truly already established. So I'm dealing with, you know, poetry or song or film. I work a lot with film, and I use that as almost a tool to unpack narrative structure and teach that back in to to businesses and clients. So um, if I'm teaching the hero's journey, as an example, I will discuss the key learnings from that and we'll use that as an algorithm for learning or for embracing the discomfort zone or for leadership or for authenticity, what, all those beautiful juicy themes that are in something like the hero's journey. But the stories that I'm using there to showcase it are established stories so we can, you know, be referencing whatever works for that audience and that's why I love it so much. So if I'm working with six-year-old kids, I'll be referencing Lightning McQueen and Sing and Moana and Batman Lego. You know, if I'm working with adults, I can still tweak and tailor it for the sorts of films or TV shows that are more or less likely to light them up as well. So some businesses love sitting in, you know, Star Wars and... (laughs) Suits and Dead Poet Society and films like that, whereas another another business or organisation's people or teams or employees, whoever I'm speaking with, you know, might be lit up more by, you know, musicals or The Greatest Showman or, mm-hmm. you know, Bridget Jones or yep. wherever it goes. But it's always sort of classic film that's beautifully scripted and does a good job at, at bringing to life character and character development. So. So, yeah, I work with established stories as well. Yeah, okay. So what... Does that make sense? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It does. I'm just formulating my question, (laughs) the next question in my mind because what I'm intrigued to know is what what is it that a client is coming for? Say, let's use the initial example you gave of a football club and working with new stories. Why would a football organisation bring you in? What are they looking to achieve at the end through exploration of these stories? Sure. So they're generally looking to achieve one of two things if I'm bought in. They're either looking to improve upon the systems and structures around their brand for, uh, you know, lack of a better term, but the narratives, the story strategy that sits in and around the club. So that could be an outward-facing brand and what are the stories and narratives that sit around this business at the moment. It could be an inward-facing brand, which is in effect an employer brand. So the brand and the stories and the narratives that are told to the people within the business. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't contradict each other by any stretch, but they're not necessarily always the exact same um, messaging Mm -hmm. or the same emphasis on on aspects of the messaging. So generally they'll come to me because they're wanting some work around brand and strategy or they'll come to me because they're wanting some work around sort of more the well-being and performance area and they're wanting to, but they're interested in using storytelling principles to help bring that to life so and that's just become word of mouth like I'm like I love all of this stuff but I don't tell my own stories terribly well so I don't have a website <laughs> for example um, I did notice that I'm like where yes, can I find out more yeah, about it I know website. everyone's like can I hear a bit more about this and I'm like oh gosh I'm on LinkedIn and I want a couple of podcasts but yeah, it's hilarious, really. It's sort of like the you know the plumber with the leaky pipes in yep. that I, I care about my own storytelling, but I just haven't committed to putting it in a <laughs> website anywhere. Too busy working um, with everyone else's stories. Um, yeah, yeah, which so far I have just been, you know, blessed, I guess, lucky enough that I'm always sort of saying, 
you know, I'm always saying yes to a lot less work than I'm saying no to, I guess. So mm. I'm, the work thus far has found me and that seems to be a bit of a word of mouth around I'm the psychologist that if you're interested in, you know, sort of brand or strategy or strategic storytelling or the narrative in and around a business or you're interested in well-being and performance and educating some people around those sorts of topics, but you're interested in applying the other half, I guess. If you want the well-being and you want to apply storytelling to bring that to life, whether it be yeah. to their own stories or we want to use stories, then then I'm your person. So, okay. so yeah. Can you yeah. give us an example then? Because that that's the bit that intrigues, well, it all intrigues me. It all sounds fascinating mm. and wonderful. But mm. this intersection between the storytelling piece, so helping, mm. say, an organisation to unpack its stories or understand its stories and the notes I've made here are the things that have come to mind as we've been talking about might be stories about you know that kind of get to the heart of who are we why do Mm. we do what we do Mm. what drives and motivates us so where Mm. does that or how does that intersect with the well-being piece Mm. Yeah, so in when I'm working with an organization's brand or the narrative around their purpose I guess what I'm doing, and and a lot of brand practitioners would be doing this as well, Um, perhaps just it it might not be as sort of top of mind for them, but a lot of them would be doing this, is I am applying a lot of the principles from PosPsych and from acceptance and commitment work as well, from contextual behavioural science. So brands never exist in a vacuum. They always exist within the reality of the business and the business's people and the business's audience. Um, so their stories affect how the business's stories are, are digested. Mm-hmm. So I sort of work with that living, breathing reality, I guess, and look at the context a lot. So content never exists without a context. So I sort of help businesses to, to you know, shape and understand which story and which narratives are more or less likely to land in an audience in a way that that builds relevance. But a great example, I guess, is if I was helping a business to sell more Mars bars, for example, Mm -hmm. I don't think Mars bars are selling beautifully, but let's just say (laughs) Mars bars weren't selling as well all of a sudden and, and you went into that business, then bad research or bad brand strategy or poor brand strategy would be to say, well, what is selling well and let's do more of that. It would be to come into a business and say, well, hang on, this is not selling too well, but look, crunchies are flying. So how do we make Mars bars more like crunchies Mm -hmm. and try and tap into that market? That would be poor brand strategy because a crunchy is a crunchy and Mm -hmm. a Mars bar is a Mars bar. So what would be great brand strategy or great? what would be good to, to help Mars bars come along again would be to come in and to really unpack the magic that sits in and around and behind a Mars bar. What is it that this brand is about? What is the experience like for consumers? What's the tribe that sits around a Mars bar doing? Why are they doing it? What lights them up? You know, what brings them closer? What distances them? What's the sort of deep DNA of a Mars bar? And then you anchor into those values and then you apply behaviours that really align with those values and you sort of do that strategically. So a lot of that is really the principles of the contextual behavioural science that sort of sits around ACT and a lot of POSSAC. This is really about sort of anchoring into the values that make sense Mm -hmm. and applying values-aligned behaviours and doing that methodically and doing that strategically, which means that you're not just sort of shooting off and throwing darts, you're being mindful in that, you're taking the time to sort of stop and sit in the gap and understand what's gone wrong and make wise choices. So when I, you know, one side of having a child, I was working hardcore in that sort of advertising strategy, high-end branding, and then the other side of, of a mat leave period, I was sort of working in well-being and with AFL footballers in particular was the audience and we were sort of helping to curate content to land in that environment and you you, you do realise that that you're sort of applying the same principles. Mm. So it it can sound a little bit jumbled up from the outside but to me it's I I kind of just keep continually keep coming back to this same intersection that is always everything about how we thrive, how whether it be an individual or a team or, or a tribe or a 
um, a bunch of people, whatever it sits at the purpose of that, uh, at the core of that can vary. But it's all about that sort of human thriving and the human condition and, and, and the role that stories play in helping people to anchor into what makes them do better or well, what makes them perform better or what, what takes them closer to their authentic self, which I think is, is more what we're sort of after these days than necessarily yeah. just a performance outcome. Yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense to me. I don't know if it's making sense to our listeners because <laughs> I don't know if they're hearing it <laughs> in the same length that I am. But certainly for me, you know, what, what calls to mind, I've just been doing some work with a, a local not-for-profit organisation here around values and it has yeah. been a, exactly that, you know, doing yeah. some exploration around who are we, what, what excites us, why do we come to work, what do we tell our friends and family about the organisation and what they do, yeah. what is our, you know, it, it is that what lights me up kind of experience and and trying to really get at the core of that so we can understand better who the team is, who the organisation is, what they're trying to achieve and then incorporate the strategy around that. So whether, you know, they're they're about to move to a new location and there's an an opportunity to kind of rejig a whole lot of things to do with how they deal with the external parts of their organisation but also internally and culturally and how do we do things. So, yeah, Yeah. I guess that, that sort of... And, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and understanding the narrative that sits around a business is really important. You know, mm. I would always, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm working with with execs or CEOs or, or boards, I, my advice is always that you need to be intimately familiar with the shadow side of the brand. So all all brands and businesses are known for something, and that's the story they tell. But they there is a, there is a shadow side. So if a business has no awareness of what their shadow side may be, um, they can continually trip up and fall into that pothole inadvertently. So now the, the shadow side may not be fair or reasonable or even true. It's it's often a hangover from a period in the past or it can be really, really unfair and it's a, it's a tension because the people inside the business can be really sick of it and tired of it and feel like we've moved on from that. Mm-hmm. But if you're not strategic about avoiding those potholes, then you will continually sort of fall into them. It's the same with our own personal development. It's sort of the whole, you know, Socrates' desire to know thyself, you know. It's, yeah, if, the blind you, spots. The blind spots are, are where we continue to go until they're no longer blind. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so there's a there's a a need, I guess, for all businesses to understand. Well, this is all the great. Even my own consulting business; these are all the things that I'm known for. This is what my clients love about working with me. You know, this is this is my sweet spot. This is where I sit. This is my differentiation. But what's the shadow side of my brand? You know, what are the frustrations? What are the points of what would, what would my clients change about working with me if they could? And then once you're armed with that knowledge, it's up to you to then decide what you then want to action or not. So it's not at all about a business being just responsive all the time and trying to fix things up. Some of the things that I know might be points of frustration are exactly who I am and I, I can't and won't change that. What mm. it means is that I'll, I'll team better with clients for whom that's not a frustration or clients that see the value in that. So, yeah, it's 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 a lot about self-awareness around a brand and a business and yeah. that's about understanding the narratives that exist and live and breathe. Yeah. So it's that beautiful, I'll throw another quote at you, that once again I haven't got it written down in front of me, but <laughs> about how society is shaped more by the narratives that it tells and believes in than it is by the wars that are won and lost. Yep. You know, so it's sort of... You know, narrative is the sort of zeitgeist. It is the culture. It is. It is. We, we're swimming in narrative all the time, and what is normalised is eventually internalised. So, I'm really fascinated in that as a psychologist, as a human being, as a parent. I'm constantly sort of looking at and interested in. You know, what are the stories that my children are swimming in all the time? Because whatever those stories are, will become internalised if they're normalised. So it sort of empowers parents to sort of get in the middle of that as well and just sort of bring some education and some light, I guess, as to why certain stories exist and what's their purpose. And, you know, it, I've got a seven and nine-year-old and, yeah, they're already at the age where they they understand that narratives are generally pushing something, there's a motivation, there's an agenda, there's something that's trying to be sold within that context of branding and mm-hmm. 
sort of bringing light to all of that as well. Yeah, and in my mind that's starting to teach and I know that's something I've talked about with a couple of guests on the podcast has been around the, the importance of critical thinking yes. for kids and teaching them how to think critically yeah. about what's what's going on. And I know for me it, it is sometimes asking my question, you know, asking my kids who are the same age as your kids, <laughs> mm, do you mm. think, you know, if they're watching something on YouTube or something and they say, oh, you know, so-and-so said this or that or I heard or someone at school, you know, I've had that a couple of times recently with my little guy who came and said, oh, someone at school told me that, I can't think of any examples at the moment, mm, but, mm, you know, I that, can imagine. That <laughs> not all octopuses have eight legs. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, I said, well, what do you think? You know, do you think yeah. that's true? What do we know about? the word octopus where does it come mm. from you know though mm. so that sort of yeah kind of digging around in there mm. the test yeah. whether something seems true or not true or or whether yeah. even it's relevant to your family you know I did have to have a conversation with them last night about the language that we use in our family and what's yeah. appropriate language and what's not and just because it might be appropriate for another environment doesn't mean it's Appropriate, appropriate everywhere in our house yeah or you wouldn't yeah that and the cultures yeah well it's real it's a really good point and the the stories that we swim around in some by choice and some because they're thrown at us the whole time they undoubtedly shape us these choices do shape us and mm. as do the people that we choose to spend a lot of time with as does the food that we choose to put in our system so you know stories do really end up shaping a lot about us so it's I find it a fascinating area. I think a lot of people come through a sort of self-development or a leadership breakthrough as well when they just really stare their stories down. You know, what are my core beliefs and, and which of those are true and which of those are outdated and understanding that you need to hold them flexibly. You need to, you know, if these, even your values, even your core set of values, if you hold on to them too tightly, then then they they become dogma. Yeah. You know, so there's flexibility and a, and a little bit of need for movement and freedom in this and an understanding that narratives that served me well 20 years ago may not serve me well now. So I used to have a very, very, very strongly held narrative or belief that I do my best work at the last minute. You know, <laughs> now that served me really, really well. And that's a narrative that would be considered by most people to be sort of positive and helpful rather than damaging. Yeah. But it's, it, it is actually no longer true. I don't necessarily now, and I, I think it's possibly just because there are so many other things on on my plate when you're sort of, you know, juggling family and we, we all wear a lot of hats. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a sister, I'm a mother, I'm a psychologist you know I'm a professional so there's lots of different hats that you that you're juggling and so I had to really stare that belief down after I you know might hit the wall a few times you know burning the candle at both ends on a crazy deadline but I was sort of sitting around thinking yeah but this is when I do my best work Mm, mm. it's like well actually no not anymore yep you know now I do my best work when it's a little bit less adrenaline filled than that and and there's room for not everything to spiral out because I'm, you know, at the eleventh hour, I then, you know, tend not to eat as well, and I don't look after the other aspects of my well-being. <laughs> you know, time. I might, yeah, I'll find myself burning the, the midnight oil at the table, and so you know, my back might seize up, and then you know, deadlines are put off. So, but you know, as a psychologist, even I didn't see that coming. I had to really sort of, you know, disappoint a couple of clients with missed deadlines on the back of, you know, a back spasm. And those sorts of that sort of change just doesn't come about until you're prepared to sit in some stillness and stare hard at your narratives and question them. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting, actually, because I've been this year, I've been delving into about 40 years worth of work in uh, research into procrastination. And um, yes. <laughs> that story that I work best, you know, pressing up against a deadline is a really. Mm common story but the research mm. kind of bears out your experience or your latter experience which is that no nobody actually does their best work yeah up well I had deadline. to really you know when I was sort of going through that process of, of questioning that and then I just thought so a line that I often give myself and lots of clients now is and what if that weren't true mm-hmm. that that's just a really simple way to unpack to it. unpack your beliefs. So yeah. what are, you know, what beliefs do I have? What beliefs do we sort of hear? You know, oh, that teaches 
you know, got a terrible reputation with boys, but she's great with girls. Okay, well, what if that weren't true? Mm. You know, or my kids watch this show and therefore it does this. Or, um, you know, my son absolutely loves doing sport four days a week. You know, what if that weren't true? So you sort of just, that we 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 are constantly it's the way the brain works we are constantly serving and fueling our own bias and the reason why we do that is as you know is for efficiency i mean if we had to rethink everything every time we came across a situation from scratch we wouldn't be getting anything done yeah we come along and we put we go oh, yeah no i've been in this environment before and therefore i know how to operate and function here and that's true and that's true and that's true and this is how i'll do that and that's great but every now and then we have to sort of stop and pause and think, well, you know, what if what if that's not always the case? So mm. when I sort of said, well, what if it's not true that I do my best work at the 11th hour, then that forces you to think of an example where you didn't do your, where you didn't work at the 11th hour, you know. So I thought, well, what about that assignment that, you know, I had to complete and I actually started it straight away because I was just really invested in the topic and I loved it. And so I hit up the library straight away and I spent a lot more time sitting in journal articles and, you know, I kind of theorised it and themed it well and la, la, la. Oh, yeah, well, I got a HD on that one. So you you can usually find evidence to fuel your bias, but yeah. you can often find evidence to the contrary and I always encourage people to do that. I think... Yeah especially once you're sort of hitting your 40s, you might be just projecting here, but <laughs> especially once you're sort of hitting your 40s and you've got a lot of, you know, a fair amount of life under your belt and a lot of beliefs are locked in and rock solid. And, um, and I just really try to come to situations, scenarios, the people I work with, all sorts of situations now, I just come to them and think, you know, I, I just bring a sense, I guess, of openness and, and curiosity and a willingness to learn something new about it. And I find that that, you know, has a, a really positive ripple effect on how I feel about being in the work and, and hopefully what it feels like to work with me. Yeah, and that, that growth mindset is sort of what comes to mind mm. there, that, you know, mm. starting to think, well, what what could I learn from this or what could I do differently here or do mm. I really believe this about myself or absolutely I've yeah. been challenged by one because I from when I was quite young had a fairly firm belief about my ability to do mathematics mm. which hasn't entirely changed yeah <laughs> but I'm yeah. trying to now because I'm helping my kids especially my eldest do his maths homework and for mm. starters I have to stop saying you know I, I can't let myself say oh mummy's just no good at maths no that doesn't help him and it starts to again kind of reinforce in his mind that they, you, you're good at maths or you're not you know that that's mm. a thing mm. and so but in order for me to stop saying it I have to kind of stop or at least test that belief a little bit mm. Mm. and say okay well maybe it doesn't come naturally to me but it doesn't mean I can't learn you no, know, so maybe I'm, I'm now joining him a different way. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm joining him on a bit of a learning. Okay, we're talking grade four maths. Mm, yeah, <laughs> but I'm going. Yeah. I'm like, right. Well, we don't know the answer to this or quite how to do it. Let's find a YouTube video that explains it, or uh, right. let's go yeah. see if Daddy knows how to do it. And and I'm mm. trying to sort of take it as a I'll I'll learn this with you at the same time rather than just shutting down and saying no, I can't do it. Go talk to your dad. Yes, that's right. yes. There's, yeah. there's growth mindset. There's challenging, helpful and unhelpful beliefs about mm. yourself, which again, mm. yesterday is are those stories mm. that we tell ourselves. And I love that. What if it it isn't true, or what if that weren't true? Mm. Because mm. that's part of that critical thinking as well, isn't it? You know, it is. Let's it is. Look this from another angle. That's right. It's just hovering above the scenario and getting a much better perspective on it. And uh, you know, I find that in workplaces especially, the people with an inability or a less of an ability to do that, to sort of step away or step up or ha- however we phrase it and just have a look around and question what about their own assumptions or th- thoughts or beliefs at the time might actually be incorrect and what about someone else's might be correct. Yep. You know, they, these are the people that are that are just nightmares to work with really. Yep. And you know, I sort of tend to say in workplaces, you want to be receiving feedback all the time. I mean, we're, the, we're human beings. Our, our, you know, you've just got to keep doing the work. There's just there's no end to 
sort of, you know, self-awareness and self-improvement and getting good at this and getting, you know, t- tapping away at things and remaining curious and open. So feedback's not the problem, but if the feedback has been repetitive, if it's, if it's been the same topic, the same thing, the same feedback for, you know, two, four, five, ten years, there, there is just something going on. You're the common denominator there. Yep. <laughs> You know, there is something going on that is just for some reason a significant blind spot for you and you, you either need to trust in that process and, and do the hard work and the uncomfortable work of unpacking that and questioning where and why that may have come from and when it formed or you just can't grow through it. You'll never grow through it. Mm. So it's fascinating, the whole growth and fixed mindset and how that applies to, to leadership and to authenticity and to all sorts of things that are necessary in today's world. Yeah, and even just introducing people to the idea that I think even there's a lot of people who are not aware, probably most of us, even myself until maybe relatively recently when I started to explore these areas in psychology a little more, that we do tell ourselves these stories and that we do get a choice. Yeah, In whether to continue to or not, you know, that, that and just becoming aware of that can make, a huge difference. I was working with a group this week and talking to them about some of these sort of similar concepts and and the stories that we tell ourselves in terms of change and our resilience and, you know, how we perhaps move forward from a point of feeling pretty stuck because of stuff that's going on around us, so organisational change that's occurring, that people feel a bit powerless within. And talking about, you know, what are the stories that you're telling yourselves and you know, I did have a couple of people when I asked them, well, what have you, we did some exercises, what have you uncovered? And said, actually, I've realized that it's the expectations I'm placing on myself that's causing me stress. For example, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I'm expecting myself to be able to solve all these problems or answer all these questions or deal with all these challenges and do it all perfectly all the time within an mm. environment where I don't have the answers and I can't necessarily help other people. Mm. Maybe I need to back off a bit on some mm. of these self-expectations in order to at least feel better. And then when I'm feeling better and less stressed and less overwhelmed, I'm probably in a better place to help others. Well, then you're in a better posi- position to, to yeah, um, make the right call about going back to the values, I guess, what, what are the values of myself or what are the values of the organisation, what really matters here and what doesn't, and then what's some behaviour that aligns with that and sort of progressing and moving forward there. Yeah. But I think it's also really important to, when we are talking about stories and how they shape us, is that I, I don't mean at all that sort of overly optimistic or positive thinking all the time is the solution. So I think we, we live in an age where, you know, some people think, well, if you're just having a really bad day, you know, jot down three things that you're grateful for and your day will turn around. And I'm yeah, like, well, yeah. I, I, I think if that has honestly been your experience, then you are blessed to have not faced a significant trauma. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some days it just feels like everything's going to fall apart and you, you need to kind of sit in that. So um, ignoring the underlying emotions isn't isn't the answer here by any stretch. So I'm all about I'm about emotional diversity. I'm a very much an embracer of emotional diversity, which is quite interesting because I think as a, a child and in a response to you know a family breakdown in my own family of origin, I was I became pretty much a Pollyanna. I became very much the optimist, and oh, this has shaped me really well. And you know I can see all of these positives that have come out of that and I can and that they're, they're real and that's true but there's also a lot of sort of pain and and grief there so it's not about ignoring all of that um, but it's it's sometimes it's about it's about questioning stories and their relevance but sometimes it's actually about unearthing the stories and the narratives that haven't had a chance to breathe and letting them to breathe as well mm. Mm. it's very much both facing up to the more difficult yeah. feelings and stories yes. in order yeah. to be able to move on and grow from that yeah I mean mm. it's just that it's, everyone's got to do the work we've got to do the work and nothing drives me more bananas than psychologists who won't do the work yes <laughs> you know it's kind of like really so you know everyone ev- we all have well it's it's just the human condition like I couldn't care less what anyone's sort of label was or what hat they wear or what their job is or we've all just sort of got to chip away and 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 do the work if we don't do anything about these sorts of stories and experiences that are within us like they will do something to us you know it is that simple they will 
you know, they will bubble up years down the track as a as a rug being pulled out from underneath, as perhaps as a physical diagnosis. You know, these these stories need to be processed. They're part mm-hmm. of sort of who we are. And so I've just always been really fascinated by stories and storytelling and the power of them and and um yeah, giving light to them. Mm. Mm. Have you read Osher Ginsburg's Back After the Break? Do you know what I haven't? And I had it in my hands the other day in the bookshop. And I thought, oh, I've got to read this because he's yes. got a podcast. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Really yes. insightful, really insightful bloke. Yes. Um, and I do really warm to Osha. So I thought, oh, I have to get my hands on this. So yes, do that. Go, I might pop it on my <laughs> Christmas list. Yes, yeah, good idea. It'll yeah, make very, that. very interesting guy. Yeah, and just as you were describing that, you know, having to deal with the stories and, and reaching a crisis point because that was very much his story was there was stuff going on mm. and, you know, I was reading it again as a psychologist. So you kind of mm. looking at, oh, yeah, there's a bit of, yeah. And part of it is just a bit of perhaps neurological wiring, just the way his brain Absolutely. works as he describes yeah. it. But yes. getting to a point where he had tried everything to push that away and push it aside and and there mm. was, you know, all, all the drugs and alcohol mm-hmm. and, and mm. dysfunctional behaviour and getting to a point of real crisis for his mm. case, it was it was psychosis, and then now talking about doing the work. So the podcast, a lot of especially the recent episodes have been about exactly that. And I think he even yeah. used that phrase: "It's about doing the work." You've just got to yeah, and it's not pretty, and it's no. not easy. But no. yeah, you've kind of got to do it. It's the whole Brene Brown thing: you, there isn't an off switch for the uncomfortable stuff. If you hit that, you hit off to everything. Yeah. Yeah, you know, no. we can't selectively mute emotions. So when you constantly avoid the discomfort, you're switching a lot off. So you're also <laughs> dulling the else. joy. Yeah, you're dulling the joy. You're dulling the awe. You're dulling that the the sort of serenity, the calm, the the that real deep seated gratitude that just sits about sitting in stillness, and um. It is remarkable how many high-level execs are running around on half a mute button, um, how many high-performing, you know, athletes. High, and, and now you sort of look at school kids and you can, you know, it's, so it's, it's important work that, that needs to be done. It's part of the human condition to avoid it. So, you know, you're not broken or damaged if you are a, a bit of an experiential avoider or you, you are trying to run from certain realities or truths but you're going to have to do the work at some stage and if not for you for the people around you mm. you know I always laugh and say it's not until that I've become a parent that I realize the real job of a parent is to sort your own shit out before you pass it on yep. <laughs> you know it's kind of like that that's that's our job it's like work on your anxieties work on your fears work on the beliefs that you're holding that are perhaps too fixed, work on all that stuff and we'll pass on other stuff that's that's not ideal but so many times, at, you know, in the schoolyard you, you just you see little people really struggling with, you know, beliefs and narratives and patterns of behaviour and, you know, sort of neuropatterning to your point earlier and you, you you don't have to look very far before you see where, where before you can see where it comes from. No, it happens remarkably so early too, doesn't it? Yeah, we've all got to do that work. Yeah. That's just core as a parent to really try and do that work. And you know that whole you know put put your um your own oxygen mask on before your child. I mean that speaks to all of that as well. That's about the discomfort. And I guess we're just as generations go on, we're just more and more informed about all of this stuff, which is good. You know, mm. post intergenerational trauma and. You know, there's all sorts of fascinating things. The epigenetics, just the, all those fields are really sort of bursting open and it's it's just a fascinating time to be working with humanity, I think. Absolutely. I did tell mm. listeners that we would allow your passion to come through, I think, as well as <laughs> really coming through. And we haven't even got onto film retreats uh, yet. I know. Well, that, and that's exactly what I was about to ask you about because we've got very deep very quickly. We but did. one of the things I'd really love you to tell us a bit about is your screen and soul work and your film retreats because you touched on this earlier and, and some of the films and, and my ears pricked up when you mentioned the word suits because that's one of my favourite shows to watch. Yeah, yeah. What is screen and soul? 
Well, Screen and Soul is my creative baby, I guess. Um, Screen and Soul are workshops or retreats and, you know, they can range from I haven't managed to sort of get one under three hours without it losing some of its meaning, but they can range from anything from sort of like three hours to a few days. But all of this stuff that we've been talking about, all of the the science around sort of that's coming out of positive psychology, that's coming out of interpersonal neurobiology, the neuroscience, the mindfulness, the acceptance and commitment theory, all of that sort of work that that I just love and and even how it extends and touches upon the more physical aspects of, you know, health and well-being and microbiomes and, you know, leadership and spiritual intelligence and how that's related to narrative and there's just this sort of whole gamut of of science, I guess, well-being science is an umbrella term that I love and that I sort of try and stay as, as much as I can across, you know, the evidence and the work and all these amazing researchers are around the world. But because of my love of story, I if I'm ever wanting to share any of that science, I I don't want to just come in to a workplace and share it. I don't know that that's playing to my strengths very well. I'm quite certain that there'd be a lot of other people that are far better at doing that than me, including obviously the primary researchers that are in the work. But what I love to do and what works well is I bring all of that to life through exploring the human condition as it's told in narrative. So to be clear, it's not at all to suggest that we want our lives to play out like a film or a TV series, but it is, so putting that thought aside, it's not at all about that. What it is about is about acknowledging that the stories that work, so the stories that get up, not the zillion scripts that don't get off the floor, but the stories that work and sort of have this combination, I guess, of, you know, critical acclaim and box office success, which means they've, you know, they've sort of got a nice character development and a good story or a plot. They're doing a bit of both. Those sorts of stories work for a reason and the reason is because they reflect and capture the human condition. Mm -hmm. And is that we're we're able to recognise ourselves in it at some level? Yeah, we're able to to recognise moments in that film. So if you're sitting in the cinema and all of a sudden your throat feels like it's about to close up because you're trying to hold back tears, you don't necessarily have to have lived that specific experience but you know that feeling. Yeah. So that actor is portraying and that script and that director, they have all done, you know, worked their their mastery and their magic to bring an emotion to life in that moment of that film. And if that lands in you and you can relate to that, it's psychophysiological. You know, films Mm. land in us as a feeling. They don't land in us as a thought. So what I do is I then come in and sort of speak to well, what is this enduring wisdom in stories? What is the enduring kind of truth? What's the narrative structures underneath that mean films work, you know, can do their bit, can 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 play their magic? And in teaching that, rather than necessarily just the character arc of one person, so we don't necessarily talk to Luke Skywalker, but we talk to, say, a hero's journey that sits underneath Luke Skywalker, mm-hmm. then that allows audiences to recognise that hero's journey in him but in Batman and in Moana and in Bridget Jones and I see it there in, you know, Indiana and I see it over there in, in, you know, Mike from Suits and, oh, there's elements of it in this. And so once you recognise and you've, you've been shown, I guess, the underlying structure and then you map over that elements of the wellbeing science, then everything you watch from then on is almost like a little subconscious affirmation or reaffirmation of that content so it's just a really nice way to showcase how it is that stories speak to humanity and to what it is to be authentic and what it is to live and to lead and then you can of course tailor the the film content for the audience so that's great you can choose different you know characters and plots to discuss or to crack open depending on whether you're speaking to sort of seven-year-olds or you know, footballers or execs or a yoga group or a book club or, you know, the general public. So, yeah, yeah, I love it. Every time I'm running a film retreat or a film film workshop, I pinch myself. I just... (laughs) I just I can't I just love everything about it and I've I've invested a lot in that in terms of my own professional development so 
for probably the last 10 to 15 years, as you know, as a psych, there's an awful lot that we need to do to keep up our licence and to continue mm. practising, and so there should be. So I've stayed abreast of, of you know, the, the thriving side, you know, the, the science and the neuroscience and the um, pos psych and ACT and, and all of that sort of stuff, but I've equally stayed across sort of screenwriting and actors' workshops and understanding narrative structure and I'm constantly in, you know, sort of actors' studios and, um, you know, working on understanding how all of that comes together and, and it, it is remarkable. I've never gone into filmmaking very deliberately because I don't want the hood completely lifted. <laughs> I've sort of been tempted a few times. I'm sort of yeah. like, God, I'm so passionate about this. Should I just be studying film and sort of becoming a filmmaker? But there is a magic in it for me. I love being the audience. Um, not at all suggesting that I'd have the creative smarts to pull it off either. But even as a passion, I deliberately stop myself from really understanding the inside of the sausage factory. But yeah, to, to, to get across film and acting and to understand what actors are doing when they're sitting in a moment in a script to understand the depths of the kind of the work there and that if the emotion is not real for them, it's not real for the audience. And there's there, that's there's interpersonal neurobiology in that. You know, this yeah. is really about, about sort of brains and minds connecting and, and there's a lot in this space that I think we're only just at the, you know, the top of the iceberg in terms of understanding how mood can be a contagion and how it can jump across and around an audience and, Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of that stuff. Yeah, a couple of things came to mind. I, I was reading just yesterday, actually, and I can't remember who it was with. It might have been an interview with one of the producers of the movie Love Actually, which, of mm. course, being a Christmas movie. <laughs> mm. And yeah. she was Great talking, there it, it was a few questions there about if you were doing it again, who would you cast, if, you know, so mm. type questions around the film to this mm. individual. And it was, I can't remember the exact phrasing of the question, but something along the lines of, the most important scene for you or the, the scene that meant the most to you and, and probably like lots of us, it was the scene in which Emma Thompson oh, realises that, <laughs> that it got the gold necklace is oh. not coming to her on Christmas Day. It's going to her husband's secretary or whoever she is. <laughs> and she said that that particular scene was filmed in a house, not on a set. They actually used a real house. She said it was in a real bedroom and in a, in a, it was a small mm. space. She said in order to, for her involvement, she had to sit on the floor and watch. And she said she was, you know, they did it seven or eight times or something. And she said Emma Thompson was able to click into that, that real emotion, those tears, that genuine feeling yeah. that then yeah. captivated everybody who's ever watched the movie and felt that along with her, whether we've had that personal experience or not, you know, like you say, the right. ability yeah. to transport someone into a different place and that in between takes she just clicked and she was back yeah. into, you know, joking and just being her normal self and then she could switch it back on again and she said it was like an acting masterclass yes. just being privy to that scene. And yes. um, before yeah. we were talking about that, um, psychophysiological response. I actually, the, the most recent movie I've seen was The Children Act with Emma Thompson. <laughs> Something right, about Emma Thompson. And yes. yeah, that for me, you know, there were moments in that film where, where again, none of it was anything that I'd experienced. Uh, there was probably themes in there that I had experienced, yeah. but, mm. um, but being able to bring that to life in a way that took me along Mm. You know, and and to have that sort of response is is fascinating. I can understand why you are so passionate. Yeah, about it and, and so that's the thing it. because you don't need to have lived that experience. But there are, as you know, um, there are a finite numbers of kind of base emotions, and mm. then all these experiences trigger one of those base emotions. So if a film is striking upon grief, or portrayal, or the feeling of being cut from the herd, I mean, these are fundamental human experiences you know we're wired to survive and we're wired to belong you know we're pack animals so we're not you know born one day and and stand up like a mini zebra and can kind of you know walk off stagger off we are fiercely fiercely dependent upon the systems and the structures and the people around us so once films tap that fear of being cut from that um, everyone has a story in them somewhere where they have felt somewhat left out of the group or cut mm. from the crop so um yeah you don't doesn't need to be the plot 
that you relate to. It's the feeling that you relate to. And so to sit around and to work with actors as well where they're learning how to tap, you know, different feelings and how do I get into, into this sort of energetically, how do I sit in this feeling? And then the repercussions, of course, for that world as well on, on well-being and how taxing this is on actors and artists. Yeah. And, you know, method acting and all these sorts of things that are a, that are amazingly beneficial to the output, to the craft of acting and the craft of filmmaking. But there is, a, you know, there there is a lot of responsibility. I think that that comes with that about what we're what we're doing, you know, mm. to and with our artists, and and um, and some, you know, some care needs to be taken there to to allow some protection there as well. So, yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating area. But to run a a film retreat you know I ran a film retreat you know a few months ago with some coaches coming through an AFL system for example and to have tissues being passed around the room and you know one minute they're all laughing another minute there's tears there's a lot of self-reflection um you know it's moving stuff and maybe I'm cheating a little bit because as the facilitator I don't I I don't need to be as good at moving (laughs) um but, but but film, you know, when you've got this medium that is designed, everything about it is packaged up to kind of cut through and to land emotionally, it just makes good sense to me to wrap wellbeing science up in that medium and to sort of teach both together. And therefore, as I said before, then every time you you watch something, it doesn't mean that you're dissecting it. You can still be in stories but you notice themes, you know, you sort of go, oh, there's that resistance that always seems to come when the world's invited us to do something, you know, is that resistance on the inside or is that coming from somewhere else? And, you know, there's this moment and this is where they need to learn to trust and this is where they're really mindfully engaged in their strengths and their values and this is the part where they're left their values behind again. And it's just a beautiful way, I think, to bring it all together and it, and it just works with so many different audiences. Yeah. And I was just thinking as you're describing it there, how many layers it's working Mm, at as well, mm -hmm. because this idea, I know I said right in our intro that you found a way to open people up to those human experiences that we find it difficult to talk about. So whether that's Mm. grief or fear or belongingness or, or whatever it might be. So using the film and the stories within the film to help people access and perhaps be a bit more open to talking about that. So it's Mm. happening at that emotional level, but you're also helping them to learn at a, at perhaps a more kind of just cognitive level about human behaviour and the sorts of things we Mm. do, why we do what we do so that then they can take that, you know, I'm thinking of it as a coach, this idea that when you're coaching, you know, you you might be talking about the issue or the challenge or the goal in the moment, but the goal of coaching really is to give people the skills to be able to do this work themselves Mm. ongoing. That's right. And that's what I love about this work as well is that I don't need to be the person that's done all the teaching of all the content. What can be mm. a really beautiful way to use a screen and soul workshop that I've found is that you can kind of come in at the end of that process. So you can come in at the end of a, a school year where kids have gone through different posed modules or schools have embraced different wellbeing topics and then you can share a screen and soul kind of workshop at the end that taps upon, you know, digs into the key themes that have been taught. So I work, therefore, with a lot of professionals that are better at doing that than I am you know they're better at coming in and teaching the science from scratch and making it playful and interactive and but then I can come in at the end and add a sort of this additional layer that really helps to sort of bring it to life and anchor it in storytelling that allows them to then see it whether it's you know through film or through gaming or through you know songs on the radio or whatever it is but it's just bringing awareness to that idea it's like when kids sort of say, oh, yeah, you know, films don't move you until you hit a certain age and it's just often because you haven't racked up the life experience. You haven't, mm. you haven't those feelings aren't sort of neurologically embedded in you yet, whereas, um, you know, so you like exciting films or funny films when you're little. But, you know, I remember I used to sort of think, oh, cinema sort of goes a little bit over my head until, you know, you're first hurt 
or you're first conscious of being sort of emotionally hurt by something and then all of a sudden, you know, every second film is speaking to you. <laughs> so, And all of know, us who are parents who are no longer able to watch things that we used to be able to watch without right. becoming yeah. so distressed because there's themes in there about, you know, loss of children yeah. or, or yeah. you know, children being hurt or harmed or any of those sorts of things that, yeah. Yeah, even, mm, that's right. And do they do anymore. shape us. Yeah. And, you need to, yeah. And, and I do take a lot of responsibility with the sorts of films that I'll, expose myself to a, a, a lot as well you know and but once I've found a film I found one at the moment that just seems just to so so beautifully capture all that I love to do and teach yeah I just I, I kind of keep getting drawn back so I'm off on Monday to see A Star Is Born with a good friend of mine and it's going to be my fifth viewing of it in the <laughs> cinema. I haven't seen it yet but it is on my list. Yeah yeah so and it's a cinematic must it's a it's sort of atmospherically and and orally like if you like the way cinema sounds Mm -hmm. it's yeah it's a must on the big screen it's just for a directorial debut I can't believe what Cooper's managed to do he's smashed it Mm -hmm. it's really good yeah so Anna, I could keep talking to you forever about this. Oh, I know, so interesting. So cool. And there's so many, um, so many questions I want to ask you. But I suppose you know, given that we're talking about film, you've mentioned mm. the Star Is Born. Are there mm-hmm. other films that you know, if, if you had to give, and I'm sure you've been asked this question before, if you had to give a, mm. like a top three movies that people really ought to see to be able Ooh. to access some of the stuff that we're it's yeah, very difficult to narrow it down to three. But to yeah. some of the stuff we're talking about, what would they be? Yeah, that's a oh, that's a tough call. However, <laughs> there are some. If you're talking about let's keep, let's narrow it back to just the hero's journey, I guess, okay. because that's an underlying narrative structure that that you know sort of covers what it is to live and to hurt and to form you know, relationships and to trust and to lose trust and to build yourself up and to go backwards and to build yourself up and to go backwards and, you know, to find meaning and purpose and have the daring and courage to kind of step into that and move forward. So the hero's journey, I guess, that underpins, well, first of all, the Star Wars films, I guess. So George Lucas apparently came across the work of Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. So all of this is sort of Joe Campbell thinking, which is remarkable and great to read up on. And George Lucas came across that and sort of said, "Well, I'm going to plot all this out in a film, and sort of see how it see how it rolls." And everyone told him he was mad. They're like, "You know, you're you're relying on ancient mythology to guide like a modern sci-fi okay. yeah. galaxy film." And he's like, "Yep." So I think I think we can, you know, I mean, hats off. I don't think anyone can question whether or not the franchise has been successful. So he nailed it, and then he readdressed it in the Indiana films. So there's lots and lots and lots of films, lots of kids' films as well, films like sort of, you know, Moana, lots of sort of superhero films where that really more obvious, and I don't mean to downplay on the the artistry at all, they're brilliant films, but the more obvious or more easily accessible hero's journey is there. Yep. And then what I love is when filmmakers sort of... Um, there's a hero's journey, but it's an inward journey. You know, it's a journey about authenticity and stepping into who I really am as opposed to an outward journey of picking up arms and, you know, battling dragons and yep. saving galaxies. So I love Strictly Ballroom. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I have seen I think I saw it yeah. many times when I was younger, but I wouldn't have watched it for a long time, so maybe yeah. I can do that so, again. <laughs> yeah, so Strictly Ballroom, so the backstory of that is Baz Luhrmann was a student at... I think no, I might have that wrong, where they were exploring the monomyth or the hero's journey and um, they had to apply that to a, a script, which actually, actually it may have even been a play first, started as a play. And so he sort of thought, and he lived in the country and his parents ran a dance school, and he sort of thought, well, what if I don't make it about, you know, dragons and, you know, demons and f- saving the world, but I just make it about a kid who wants to dance his own steps? Mm-hmm. You know, how does it how does it play out when you're talking about a much more everyday issue and just someone who's just trying to find the courage to step into their more authentic self and and shake things up a little bit, a bit of positive disruption. And um and Strictly Ballroom was sort of born of that. And and now of course character development is really whether or not the screenwriters ever intended to touch upon any element of the hero's journey, there will always be little aspects of it in there. It's just simply because it captures humanity and the human truth so Mm. I'm not a fan of films that's so 
sort of obviously spell it out that you can almost tell, oh, well, this is that part of the script where this is going to happen. I love the way filmmakers might shake it up and flip it around and reverse orders and some might just focus the entire film on one part of the journey or this or that. But the the fundamental human truth that Joseph Campbell identified in, in the ancient stories in mythology and, and the enduring wisdom that sits in there you will see once you're aware of that and the steps and stages you will see elements of that in, mm. in any story you're exposed to yeah so I can kind of spot it here and there and everywhere I've got some favorite foreign films that I just that just nail it beautifully you know but dead poet society you know Star Wars, things that are quite accessible for people are great ones to share in film retreats. I usually like to spread it out a bit. I usually like to pick, you know, a musical, a kid's film, a rom-com, a drama, a thriller, certainly not all American films, um, you know, some foreign films, some Aussie film. I like to sort of shake it up a bit because that way you're reinforcing to the audience that you can spot these themes everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's not just yeah. in one kind of genre or one domain yeah. or one nationality ever. It, it's it's everywhere. Yeah. And, and that's as it is in life. As it is in life. And that's simply because, yeah, filmmakers are trying to capture something of the human condition. I mean, at the end of the day, they do want to move an audience somehow from A to B. So to do that, you are tapping the emotion that's inherent in your audience, which means you're speaking to humanity. So it's, yeah, once you know the themes, it's it's kind of all everywhere. It's great. Amazing. <laughs> I've learned so much. Up. Where are you, Ballarat? Did I'm you in ba- yeah, I'm in Ballarat. Yeah. I was just I'll have to come up, and, come up and run one up there for you. Yeah, look, perfect um, place. Be, perfect sit place. around and talk about your favourite films. Yeah, look, it's um, very <laughs> exciting. I'll be there, absolutely, <laughs> with bells on. And I thank you so much for everything we've spoken about today. It, it's been a real whirlwind and you've given me so much to think about and so much to explore on so many different levels. <laughs> um, not the least, I'm going to be looking for things in movies now. I'm even thinking back to the movies that I've seen recently and gone, oh yes, is this what I loved about it? It took me on this mm. journey. Mm. Where can people, I know you said that you haven't got your website mm. up yet. <laughs> I know, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I really need to get a screen and soul landing page just as a starter. Yes, yes. Um, as do, I said, I'm just so lucky at the moment. So far it's been word of mouth. It has just meant that I'm busy doing the doing rather than promoting the doing, which is great I'm you know I pinch myself every day I love it but I uh, yeah there isn't a landing page per se but obviously there's I mean LinkedIn sort of gives a description I guess of, yep. of, of what I do but that's a you know that's not a very exciting place to be is it <laughs> <laughs> You know, not the it. most exciting, but you no. Well, look, I'm, I'm thinking about, and, and maybe this is a conversation that you and I can have offline, we can put something together because I'm thinking about our audience listening to this and I have no doubt that you have excited their uh, <laughs> thought processes and in their curiosity and they're going to want to know more about lots of the things that we've spoken about today. Um, yeah. I'll put down lots of links to you know, some of the quotes and some of the films and some of the research that you've mentioned. Um, Mm. And maybe you and I can just work behind the scenes a little bit to come up with a few other places where people might be able to find out more about this content and, and the work that you're doing. Yeah, and certainly just to drop me a yeah, certainly just to drop me a line. Like, you know, drop drop me an email if yeah there's questions or curiosities or you'd like to know more about it. But yeah, I, I just love it. I've I've literally run film retreats with you know, grade one and two students through most school ages to I teach film as therapy at the School of Life in in Melbourne. So that's a, a workshop that sort of incorporates all of this film with thriving content. And then, yeah, I've run it in elite sport and in high-level exec and with teachers. It's fantastic for teachers as well for just a nice well-being day out for them. Yeah. I've taught it in kind of pastoral contexts in, you know, in churches with book clubs and it's never ending really. But, yeah, because you can tailor both the well-being topics they're interested in and then the film choices that we discuss and sort of share, it's nicely applied in all sorts of settings. Yeah, sounds like I can think of lots of applications mm. already. So, <laughs> mm. so well, we will put that together. That will all be in the show notes for people to find out more and how to contact you as well. And mm. I thank you so much for... You're so welcome. It was great to speak with you. ...everything you've shared. And, yes, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm going to book myself in for, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
<laughs> the next re- yeah. next retreat that you're um, that you're going to hold here in Ballarat. Yeah, or maybe I can come to Melbourne and we can explore it further then. Yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. That was the fabulous Anna Box, psychologist and story strategist, talking about film and narrative and the stories that we tell ourselves and her screen and soul workshops. And now, by her own admission, Anna's a bit difficult to find online, but Jay and I have put together a link to her LinkedIn profile, and she's very happy for you to make contact with her if you'd like to find out more about her work. We've also compiled her tips and her film recommendations in the show notes for this episode, and you'll find all of those at potential.com.au forward slash podcast. I mentioned this last week, but if you'd like a copy of our very comprehensive and very free downloadable collection of over 130 parenting, performance and well-being tips from our podcast experts from seasons one through to three, you will also find a link to download that guide at potential.com dot au forward slash podcast just hit the big button on the episodes and show notes page you cannot miss it and you will have that free compilation of tips winging its way to your inbox instantly while you're there you might also like to check out my ebook the positive parenting toolkit which is a compilation of the biggest best and most helpful positive parenting ideas that i've come across and use myself as a parent it's currently on sale for just i think eight dollars fifty very cheap and if you enjoyed today's episode or you're enjoying the show in its entirety please do let us know by giving us a rating or review in itunes If you're listening on an iPhone right now, you can just scroll on down to the bottom of the list of potential psychology episodes and you'll see a little row of stars and you can click on the stars to rate. And if you scroll a little further, you'll see a link that says write a review. And we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you think of the show and perhaps what episodes you found most helpful or perhaps even give us a tip on who you'd like to hear from or a topic you'd like us to cover. I do read and really appreciate every single review and of course our ratings and any comments as this helps us to spread the word about the podcast and the amazing work of our guests. Okay, speaking of guests, on to next week's guest. This one is a late night international link up with Dr. Desiree Dickerson, who's a neuroscientist and psychologist. And we're talking about brains and well-being and what we can do now to ward off dementia and cognitive decline as we age. Desiree is delightful and very knowledgeable. And here's a little of what we discussed. Our brains are are novelty detectors. It's what they're trained to do, you know. It's what they're trained to find, what will eat us, what will kill us, what will, you know, make us sick, you know, from our sort of cave-dwelling ancestors' perspective. You know, so if our brains aren't exposed to novel things, then they simply maximise their output with as little energy or effort as possible. And that means routine, that means autopilot for a lot of our lives. So if this brain is a a use it or lose it muscle, we tend to use it less and less for what it's meant for. If we genuinely want to keep our brains healthy, if we want to grow new neural connectivity, if we want to maintain it at its optimum, have it perform for us as it can, as it could, then we need to use it. Join me for that interview in episode 35 of the Potential Psychology Podcast. Thank you, as always, for listening. Have a great week and go forth and fulfil your potential.